Good day, Brigade! This is Bobby coming at you with the podcast here. This week we've got an ideology of the month, though I wouldn't exactly call it ideology as much as idea within concept of ideology. Anyways, what we're going to be covering is the idea of sovereignty today. One we've kind of been ignoring for a little while here. And, well, we feel it's kind of come up as an important thing right now. So, before we get started into all of this, I would like to make some corrections from last week's special episode on the Ukrainian people. I would like to, first off, apologize by saying Ruthenians, Ukrainians are effectively the same. This is not entirely accurate. So, Ruthenian is actually an exonym created by the Western world through Latinization to refer to pretty much all Rus peoples. It refers to Ukrainians, the Carpathian, well, some of the Carpathians, not all of them, some of them, the Rusian, the Russians, the Belarusian. It, it refers to all of them, but again, it's an exonym, which basically means it came from outside the culture to describe them. In fact, you might find that most of your maps are largely written in exonyms. For example, most people don't call China by its proper name, like Zhongguo, and most people do not call Greece by its proper name of Hellas. Yeah, we call Greece Greece, even though it's Hellas. Anyways, a couple more corrections on that. The Ukrainian peoples are technically a type of Ruthenian, but again, Ruthenian is an exonym and has largely fallen out of favor and usage throughout the society throughout modern society, partly due to being used as an insult and partly due to kind of changing what it refers to, who it refers to all the time. I think the most recent peoples it referred to before it kind of ceased was the carpatho ruthenians and a lot of them fall into the Rusian group. Anyways, that's for corrections now. Stay strong, Ukraine. Fight hard. Love you guys. Fuck Russia. Well, not even fuck Russia. Just fuck Putin of Russia. (laughs) Because as we've heard, a lot of people within Russia are protesting and saying, Hey, this is not okay. Anyways, as we get on to a fact for you today. (laughs) Did you know that in the United States, in most states, you can legally own a flamethrower and it doesn't count as a firearm? Why is that? Because technically it counts as a tool and can be used for a variety of things like brush removal, ice removal, and things along those lines. And thus qualifies as a tool. Interesting, right? Uh, States of New York and California do have restrictions on flamethrowers, but on a federal level, they're not guns. They're tools. You can totally own one. Totally build one. Sounds like fun. Anyways, on with our show. So, as we stated previously in the uh, first of fact and corrections, we're going to be covering sovereignty. Not really an ideology, but an idea that's kind of important right now. Like, there's a couple peoples I think would be pretty... pretty certain they want to defend their sovereignty, like Ukraine for example. So, to start, what is sovereignty? Sovereignty is more or less your supreme authority within a territory. It entails the hierarchy of a state, the external autonomy, as well as any external autonomy for for the states. Sorry, kind of stumbled there. (laughs) In any state, sovereignty is assigned to the person, body, or institution that has ultimate authority over the people in order to establish the law or change existing law. In this political theory definition, sovereignty is a substantive term from that designates supreme legitimate authority over a polity or peoples. You know, basically a designated legitimate authority. In other words, Putin trying to make himself authority over Ukraine would be a violation of Ukrainian sovereignty. In international law, sovereignty is the exercise of power by a state. 
It can come in two forms in this regard. It can come to the de jure sovereignty, which refers to its legal right to do so, or its de facto sovereignty, which is kind of... Actually, that's kind of what's happening. Think, for example, Taiwan Formosa. It would be an example of de facto sovereignty without being de jure sovereignty. It's de facto because they do effectively more or less govern themselves. It's de jure, it's not de jure though because right now the world doesn't really recognize Taiwan for the most part because this thing called the People's Republic of China or Zhongguo in its endonymic terms. So what is this a prob- why is this a problem? I think that's pretty obvious, but this becomes a problem when you fall into the idea of who is the actual authority over a territory. Especially with the case of Taiwan and Ukraine, or at least in particular Taiwan for this example, because Taiwan also had its own governmental authority separate from both the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China during that whole Chinese Civil War. It was previously known as Formosa, and the Formosans were, you know, not super keen on that. I should also point out that Formosa is also an economic name. Though, people, though the people who lived originally on the island, not the Han Chinese that later came after the, uh, more or less, ceasefire diaspora defeat, though they do not acknowledge defeat, so, you know, keep that in mind. Um, it basically is kind of a, hey, so we're going to come over here and take over. This is our country now. It's a part of China, right? And there's some Formosans that are like, uh, hold on. And it kind of leads to a weird situation there. In the case of Ukraine, Ukrainians have been fighting for their independence and sovereignty for fucking centuries now. And they more or less got quasi-state recognition when the Soviet Union came about and took over the territory and created the Ukrainian SSR. Now keep in mind that the Ukrainian SSR was not necessarily an independent state, but rather a satellite state of the Soviet Union, and thus kind of like a puppet in function. But it was basically a real established territory for Ukraine. And my god, that was a long time coming. After the fall of the Soviet Union and the wall coming down and Russian influence receding back into Russia, the Ukrainian people declared their independence and became an independent nation state. This is where we get the wonderful Ukrainian people we have today. However, Putin here doesn't want to kind of acknowledge that sovereignty and believes Ukraine is just a part of Russia. He is wrong. He is very, very wrong. But we're definitely going to see some interesting things as that situation unfolds. So, what are the various forms of sovereignty? Well, the current notion is that there is state sovereignty. The sovereignty of states to act and function, which is where we get our modern idea of nation states and all that. There are four aspects aspects consisting of territory, population, authority, and recognition. It can also be understood as domestic sovereignty, which is the actual control over a state exercised by an authority organized within it, and interdependence sovereignty, the actual control of movement across the state's borders, and inter international legal sovereignty, formal recognition by other sovereign states, which is kind of the one that most people look for when you're looking to get like UN membership and things like that. And then you have the concept of Westphalian sovereignty. There is no other authority in the state aside from the domestic foreign sovereign. So examples of such other authorities could be like a political organization or any other external agent. You know, that kind of thing. But what exactly is Westphalian sovereignty? Well, it's more or less what we just covered in the first part. It's basically that. Its name comes from the concept of the Peace of Westphalia after the end of the Thirty Years' War. 
more or less its idea was to try to create the idea of the modern nation state and thus became more or less what we see as the first ideas of sovereignty for a modern system that we have today. These four aspects will appear together with most states and most sovereign states. However, this is not always the case, and as we've covered, there are a lot of examples of this. There are states that are sovereign in some aspects and some not in others. This is where we kind of get like vassal states and free association and that kind of thing. So. Why is sovereignty important? Well, sovereignty is important because it kind of gives the people a way to govern themselves and a way to identify themselves as separate without necessarily having to go into ethnic lines or anything like that. See, the United States, for example, we're kind of a mix of various ethnicities and stuff like that. So using a traditional ethnic claim for a sovereignty doesn't really necessarily work and our authority derives from the consent of the governed. On paper. <laughs> so, the, so, the authority to govern, or in this case, the authority to hold sovereignty over the United States, comes from the consent of the people, which is why we have our electoral system. Again, on paper. <laughs> if you want to get realistic, it technically comes from the consent of this electoral college, which is comprised of Kalaze people, la la la, going into American civics. <laughs> but the idea is that it comes down to this. Your sovereignty comes from the consent to govern within a democratic system. In a more authoritarian system, it comes from your ability to acquire the trust and confidence of the people, or basically just stomp out all other competition. So, what can we divide it into? Well, it's interesting to think about, because sovereignty can come into two basic ideas. There's the idea of the social contract, which is more or less what we just described, and the idea of forceful authority, which we also just kind of described. But that's basically where you get your two major ideas. So. Who's an important fella to talk about here? Well, you're going to want to talk about Thomas Hobbes and his book, The Leviathan. So Thomas Hobbes put forward a conception of sovereignty similar to a guy named Baden, which... Just... Whoa. Hold on, sorry, my notes are kind of mixed up here. Basically, Thomas is hot. Hobbes' idea was the version of the social contract or contractarian theory, which we've described, arguing that to overcome the nasty, brutish, and short quality of life without the co cooperation of other human beings, people must join in a commonwealth and submit to a sovereign power. This was Hobbes' theory. Hobbes was very much an individualist man. Individualism was super big in the Age of Enlightenment, and for obvious reasons. I mean, when you think about it, it was kind of the birth and growing of capitalism, the dawn of modern nation states, and the beginning of the decline of really these imperial powers. Now, it's easy to argue that, oh, imperialism didn't really die until World War I, and you're absolutely right, but the first symptoms really started showing around the Peace of Westphalia. When people were starting to go, hey, wait a minute. Now keep in mind the Magna Carta and all that had existed for a few hundred years at this point even. And in the United Kingdom at least, you definitely had a parliamentarian system and such that you were creating the modern building blocks to democracy and starting to get away from the whole we need kings and monarchy, monarchs and ending the monarchist order. So... With these individualist ideas of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and a few others, and Baden, as we've stated. The Commonwealth can compel them to act in a common good, and this is why people of individualist nature must coalesce around a Commonwealth in unity and submit to a sovereign power. So, in Hobbes' definition of sovereignty, it goes beyond both Westphalian and Baden sovereignty by saying that the sovereignty must be absolute, 
because conditions could only be posed on a sovereign if there were some outside arbitrator to determine when he had violated them, in which case the sovereign would not be the final authority. Which is kind of interesting, because this is where you get kind of the division of power starting to formulate. So, in the American system, for example, the executive branch with the president is typically seen as the strongest, best branch of whatever, whatever have you. This is only a third of the total sovereign power in the United States, however. Another third of it is held by the legislature, which keeps a check on them, on the executive, and the other is the judicial, which can keep a check on both the legislature and the executive as well. The system of checks and balances effectively divides the sovereign power between three major branches in the American Union, as opposed to an absolutist or a monarchist system or even an authoritarian system which would center it around an individual or even just a small group of individuals, which in that case you get more of an oligarchic appearance. Now, the other condition Thomas Hobbes believes is that it must be indivisible. The sovereign is, only the, fi is the only final authority in his territory. He does not share final authority with any other entity, and Hobbes held this to be true because otherwise there would be no way of resolving a disagreement between multi the multiple authorities. In other words, there's got to be a final authority on some things. Just like the judicial can basically say, okay, this is what this case says, we're done. The legislature can pause, go up and be like, well, we could write a law to change it so that the game systems are set and that the mechanics can change. But when it comes down to it, it resolves the basic disagreement between authorities. Hobbes' hypothesis that the ruler's sovereignty is contracted to him by the people in return for maintaining their physical safety led him to conclude that if when, when the ruler fails, the people recover their ability to protect themselves by forming a new contract. And this is kind of where you get the idea from Thomas Jefferson of the healthy state of a republic is every 20 years a revolution. Because the consent of the governed has to be renewed. In other words, the social contract has to be renewed. And you can reasonably argue that that social contract really needs to be renewed in the American Union and a lot of places right now. However, we seem to be all holding strong to the threats of Russia right now, and that's great. Kind of a little bit of a roundabout way of saying that, but... That was basically Hobbes' main hypothesis. He really shaped the concept of it of sovereignty through this social contract theory. In fact, it's still used today in a lot of examples. In fact, a lot of companies are run off the idea of a social contract. Many governments function through this idea of a social contract. Have you ever said you'll give someone something to hold on to while you do something that you're borrowing from them, and when you give it back they give you the thing that you let them hold on to? Guess what? Social contract. Yeah, that's basically the idea here. So, later, later, contemporary of Hobbes here comes up, named Jean Jacques Rousseau, comes up with the definition for popular sovereignty. So, what is popular sovereignty? Popular sovereignty is the principle that the authority of a state and a government are created and sustained by the consent of its people. You know, that thing we've been kind of beaten in hard. This idea was really pushed by people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, as we've stated previously, Thomas Hobbes, another guy we've talked about a lot, and a man you might be familiar with, but not really sure why you might be familiar with, known as John Locke. Why should you be familiar with John Locke? Well, in the American Union, if you've ever heard of the phrase, the right to life, liberty in the pursuit of happiness that's actually a paraphrasing of john locke who stated that people are entitled to life liberty and property now we can talk about john locke's theories on property for another in time because whoo boy he had some crazy ideas there but really what we're going to be covering is you know popular sovereignty though we kind of beaten that dead horse haven't we <laughs> Anyways, you really get the ideas of po popular sovereignty, especially with the dawning of the American Union. That's kind of why we're kind of 
referencing that a lot is because a lot of these guys were coming up with these ideas around the time of the founding of the United States as an independent entity from the United Kingdom. In fact, Benjamin Franklin himself expressed the concept when he wrote, in free, gov quote, in free governments, the rulers are the servants, and the people are their superiors and sovereigns. So keep that in mind. Because in a democratic society, whether you realize it or not, that is always the case. You shouldn't have to impress your leader in a democratic society. They need to impress you. They aren't the job provider. They're the one asking for the job. You're the employer. And that's basically popular sovereignty in a nutshell there. Rousseau considered sovereignty himself to be inalienable. He condemned the distinction between the origin and the exercise of sovereignty, a distinction upon which constitutional monarchy and representative democracy is founded upon. Yeah. So, that's kind of weird. <laughs> Condemning the distinction of the origin and the actual exercise, yeah. So as we've covered, both the origin and the exercise are kind of like hand in hand. Rousseau didn't exactly believe that, but you know, there's everyone who has their own beliefs and it is debatable an idea. John Locke and Montesquieu, if you're familiar with his name, are also key figures in the concept of democracy as we've just stated previously. But... They're a little bit different than Rousseau, and are more on the idea of Hobbes with the idea of it's arguably still an alienable right. Like, you're not entitled to sovereignty, you're not guaranteed sovereignty. But, this kind of leads into an interesting question. And one that, at least the People's Republic of China, has shown very recently that they're taking a side on. By going in and talking to Ukraine, they've shown the possibility of supporting the right of Ukraine's sovereignty. And under China's general, under the People Repu People's Republic of China's general philosophy, the sovereignty of smaller states should be guaranteed and protected. In other words, China is arguing that sovereignty is an inalienable right in this case. And that's kind of what the whole world is arguing at this point is, hey, Putin, Ukraine has the right to sovereignty. In this case, the right is inalienable. Back off. Now, if you go back to the 19th century and such, Putin might have a stronger argument for fighting the Ukrainian sovereignty movement and all that, but 21st century, Ukrainians are a people, Ukrainians are a people, they are internationally recognized people, they are an internationally recognized independent state, and you need to back the fuck out. Stay strong, Kiev. Anyways, as we come to it, this is kind of what we're saying, is sovereignty is kind of a baseboard for all of this. Now, whether or not you want to accept the inalienability of sovereignty itself, is a question up for debate and whether or not it should be long nationalistic lines, ethnic lines, or anything like that. Again, up for debate, though many people would argue against it. And some people would actually argue in favor of it. There's, there's basically that idea. But a state is sovereign if and only if it has its people, its people consent to its authority, that authority is derived from legitimacy, and that authority is not being removed. It doesn't have any reasonable challenge to its authority. That's basically. Now, some things that sovereignty is not. Sovereignty is not necessarily independence. However, sovereignty can be transferred as a legal right whereas independence cannot. Now what do we mean by that? One can still have the legal rights of sovereignty without necessarily being an independent nation. And this is kind of, again, as we go back to the idea of vassal states. So we keep saying vassal state. What is that? Well, it's kind of an old concept that still comes from monarchist systems, 
But basically, a vassal state is a state that has some autonomy and independence, but its foreign relations and things like that are handled by a greater power, which is the sovereign over... Well, not necessarily the sovereign, but rather the ruler of the foreign affairs of that nation-state. In other words, in foreign affairs, its affairs are the same as, as their affairs. A modern example would probably be the Union State principle between Russia and Belarus, which is why Lukashenko and Belarus are so willing to join in on this, like it's a freaking heart, like it's their freaking birthday. Because effectively, when it comes to foreign policy, Belarus has none. It belongs to Putin. Under Union State, Belarus has sovereignty, and on paper has independence, but in reality, Belarus is just Russia's bitch. If Lukashenko says anything, he's an idiot. He doesn't have any real authority. Well, he does, but he doesn't. He has a legal authority, and he has an enforceable authority, but in terms of whether or not he has a right to that authority, fuck no. He does not. And in fact, Lukashenko should be thrown out of fucking Belarusian government now. Especially since he's just ended the non-nuclear status of Belarus, meaning Putin is probably going to be willing to move nukes into Belarus in the near future. It's not a guarantee, but there's the strong possibility. And if that's the case, now we're dialing the di knob up to 11. But again, as we've heard recently, China is in talks with Ukraine, and... Well, if Russia tries anything funny, it's likely the People's Republic of China isn't going to back them. Now, will they necessarily back the United States in the West? Maybe-ish. But guaranteed, they're not going to be siding with Russia anytime soon, especially if World War III breaks out. That's... that's gonna be a... Who we're, who's are gonna give them the best offer. But... That's not really the point. The point is, Belarus under the Union State is basically a vassal, and would be an idea of sovereignty without necessarily having true independence. Yes, there is a state called Belarus on a map, but no, it's not necessarily that. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting way to look at it. And you can even hold sovereignty in another way where you basically have a, foreign, a government that's been exiled from its land. This was very more common in World War II, and a lot of that always happened. Anywho, as we wrap up, the basic idea is we're going to say that sovereignty is a right, an inalienable right, but a right that is very hard to defend. All states that earn it should definitely have sovereignty and independence. Ukraine is a prime example of sovereignty of a state that needs sovereignty and independence. Belarus has become a puppet of Russia and needs to be liberated and given their sovereignty and independence back. Which the Belarusian uprising a couple of years ago actually kind of demonstrated that very clearly. And... Russia's just thrown the East into shithole for no good reason other than they thought they saw an opportunity and that opportunity was closed. They need to fucking stop, basically. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for listening to our show. We have begun the move to a new podcast format, or rather a new podcast platform. We are moving to Speakerly. And we're definitely going to have more ads coming up, but so sorry about that. There is going to be ads and that's partly so that we can try to generate a little bit of revenue in order to actually kind of help pay for the whole speakerly thing because they will not do everything for us for free. Whereas Anchor did provide us with a lot of free tools. They didn't necessarily give us the right to advertise automatically. Speakerly is a little different. 
we could pay to be on the platform and get a lot of storage and a lot of good data and all that and allow them and allow them to put ads on there but in exchange we also will get a cut of that revenue so if you hear ads now starting to pop up on our podcast that would be why we're not 100 percent totally moved from anchor yet but we should be within the next few days and by the time the next episode for the podcast rolls around we'll definitely be 100 percent off of anchor and more or less out of spotify now spotify wants to start showing some strength and change and start fully working towards the joe rogan problem more then we'll consider coming back but until that time sorry we're moving you can still have our you can still have the right to put us on your platform but we will support you openly no longer anyways well we work on that we aren't going to have really a feed rss feed or a link quite yet set up still working on that particular part you can still go to the usual link right now anchor.fm backslash bobby bha b-a-h-b-i dash barnett b-a-r-n-e-t-t and it still currently works we're going to have it be a redirect soon so if you still want to donate it is still possible through that platform but do note that we will be closing that window soon speakerly will also allow us to put onto multiple other platforms which is amazing so we'll be visible through a lot more platforms in the near future Anyways, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to our corrections as well. We are we do sincerely apologize for using that XNM so casually and assuming that it was a part of the ethnic identity, though that is not necessarily correct. We do apologize. Anyways, those who wish not to be tread on should mind where they step. Putin, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, beat with a brick. Ukraine, good luck out there. Stay strong, hold Kiev. And... If you have the courage, bravery, balls, or audacity and want to get involved as much as you can with this whole struggle for Ukraine, go to your nearest diplomatic Ukrainian diplomatic mission or email them. Or even call them or anything like that. They will gladly take any and all help they can get. If you want to be a volunteer, be a volunteer. They will take you. Zelensky has made this very clear. Anything you can do to help the Ukrainian people, they will gladly take. And we encourage it. The Mongoose Brigade is in open support of Ukraine. Anyways, like us, hate us, regardless, share us, and have a great night and a pleasant tomorrow. Thank you for listening.